Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to Schneck Foundation's Community Conversations webinar, Addressing Mental Health and Wellness. My name is Laura Kirtley. I am the board chair for Schneck Foundation and your moderator for tonight's webinar. We know that this year, uh, this past year especially, has had enormous challenges across the globe, from young to old and in between. I think even before COVID-19, the prevalence of mental illness among youth and adults was increasing. The emergence of the pandemic certainly has brought renewed attention to our emotional well being. Mental health is a topic that always comes up when we ask community members and providers about uh, health needs of a population. With that in mind, the foundation has brought together three mental health and wellness experts from this community to share their knowledge, some tips and advice with our audience. Before I begin those introductions, there are a few housekeeping items for our attendees. Beginning with, this is a recorded webinar. Only those speaking tonight will have their microphones on and the audience's microphones are automatically muted. Following the presentations of each of our panelists, there will be an opportunity for a question and answer session. Attendees may type questions online by clicking the Q&A function. Those typed and submitted questions will be sent in a queue to me, and I will then ask the panelists to respond. Those questions can be anonymous by clicking the box if you choose. You access the Q&A function by hovering over your screen and the control panel should then appear. Typically, the control panel is at the bottom of some devices, but I know there are tablets that may display the function at the top. We just ask that you use the Q&A function and not the chat icon. In case you missed any of this, I will go over this part again briefly prior to the question and answer sessions. So let's meet tonight's panelists. Our first introduction is Dr. Joyce Spurgeon. She is a board certified psychiatrist with the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and she provides services to adult patients. Dr. Spurgeon practices at Schneck Mental Health and Wellness and has been on the medical staff at Schneck since 2015. Also with us is Dr. Jill Christopher, who is a clinical psychologist at Christopher and Associates in Seymour. She works with children with behavioral, emotional, and developmental disorders, and also conducts psychological evaluations for children, adolescents, and adults. Finally, our third panelist is Meredith Henry. Meredith began her career in social work as a family case manager and therapist at Centerstone. Currently, she served as, as a licensed social worker for Seymour Community Schools and has done so for the past 12 years. I can't think of a better panel to have on board for this presentation. We appreciate your commitment to promoting mental health as a critical part of our overall wellness and your willingness, ladies, to participate in our platform tonight. So let's start this off with Dr. Spurgeon. Thank you. So normally I'm asked to talk about depression and anxiety. I'm gonna throw sort of a curveball tonight and talk to you a little bit about a New York Times article that came out um, I believe it was in April of this year. The name of the article is called, There's a Name for the Blah You've Been Feeling. It's called Languishing. This article spoke to me and I hope to share some helpful insights with you. There are a lot of people who just do not feel like themselves right now. We are hopefully getting to a time where we can see sort of the pandemic is maybe getting under control, yet we don't really feel happy. When something really good happens, a job promotion, our kids do something good, um, why, why can't we feel happier? Well, just like we've learned lots of new catchphrases during this pandemic, the newest word is languishing. So what does languishing mean? And it's a sense of stagnation or emptiness. It's like everything that should be bright feels a little duller. 
Languishing is not the same as depression. There are clear criteria that delineate what depression is and is not. It is somewhere though in the middle of depression and a sense of well-being. You feel like everything in your life just feels a little harder. It's hard to focus on things. You're not motivated to do things, even things that previously might have brought you a great deal of joy. There's a good chance that you're not producing at work or at home as well as you have in the past. The scary part of languishing is that it sets us up sort of on a slippery slope. We don't always really see how we're letting things slide. It's almost like we don't care that we don't care. There's an interesting study that was done on healthcare workers in Italy, the ones who were languishing in the spring of 2020, which is sort of the time it had hit very hard in Italy, were three times more likely to be diagnosed with PTSD than their peers. So what does that mean? Does it mean that if you are languishing, you are destined to become mentally ill? No, it doesn't mean that. But does it increase your chances of have, being diagnosed with mental illness over time? Possibly, I think the jury's still out on that. But it seems logical that it would increase your risk. So why am I talking to you about languishing? Because I am seeing it in a lot of my patients, my friends, my world. Over the time of this pandemic, I think everything has just felt harder. So our brains are designed to deal with higher stress. We do that pretty well for short periods of time, but something happens to our brains when we expect them to be on high alert for long periods of time. In some ways we become more desensitized to risk, but as that constant arousal state has continued through the pandemic, it is not without emotional consequences. And this is where the concept of languishing comes in. Think about the people you know. I suspect it will not take you long to identify in them or even yourself, some of this concept of just trying to get through the day. So what do we do about it? Well, one of the suggestions in this article is that the concept of flow might be the antidote to languishing. Flow is that state of mind or being where you're so involved in a meaningful activity that you sort of don't feel and see and sense the things around you. It's almost like the present melts away a little bit. Can you even think of an activity that you've done lately that has allowed you to escape to this level? Early in the pandemic, people who were able to immerse in hobbies and activities managed to avoid languishing. However, as the pandemic has continued, it seems harder to stay immersed in anything. It is difficult to find new challenges or meaningful things when your ability to focus is altered. One of the biggest complaints I have heard increasing throughout the pandemic is I can't focus or I can't think. I can't tell you how many people think that they now have ADHD even though they've never had it before in the past. Focus has become a problem long before the pandemic where you're expected to keep up with multiple messages from multiple sources. And if someone waits more than 20 minutes for your response, somehow you have failed them. However, with more interruptions in this past year, it appears that we maybe have hit a tipping point. Fragmented attention is the enemy of engagement and excellence. This is absolutely true. Think about how hard it is to sit down and stay focused on one thing and actually complete it. Can you go back and forth between things and still get the same sense of satisfaction? Can we set ourselves some goals that will allow us to sort of limit the interruptions we allow? There are plenty of studies that show we are more productive when we limit interruptions, but how do we do that in real life? I don't have all the answers to any of this. However, I think just like with the treatment of depression and anxiety, the treatment of lang languishing is all about deliberate action. First, we have to identify we have a problem. Next, we have to assess the depth and breadth of the problem. Then we have to figure out some solutions. That's basic problem solving 101, right? Some simple things to start with are basic ways of taking care of yourself. Trying to eat more healthy. How many of us have, have gained the COVID-20? It's sort of like the freshman 15. Um, trying to make sure we get adequate sleep. When you're having lots of stimuli, it's very, very hard to shut your brain down at night and get some sleep. Exercise is always a good way to relieve stress and trying to set some boundaries on your time. Basically, try not to let the interruptions constantly pull you from one thing to another. 
limiting electronics. While lots of people enjoy Facebook and TikTok, it can be a, a black hole for people. And it is not a deep sustained connection that you get from social media. We have turned to social media and technology in the midst of this pandemic as a way to decrease the isolation we felt. However, is it possible that now we are allowed, that we are allowed to get out and be a little more social that we are having a hard time transitioning back to the less social media, more human interactions. As humans, surely we have learned over this past year that we need community and that the lack of real life interactions has been difficult for all of us. Basically, I don't have a lot of great answers. I really just wanted to give you some food for thought this evening and to ask you to ask yourself, am I languishing? Am I prospering? Um, and if you're not sure, how do we figure out that answer? And as you think about that, I'm going to pass on to Dr. Jill Christopher. All right. Thank you. Well, that was interesting. And the topic of languishing is a good segue into what I wanted to talk about tonight with children and adolescents. Um, I do a lot of work with children and adolescents here in my office, as well as in the local school system. So I've seen the effects of COVID on mental health in various settings, and we have definitely seen an increase in referrals here to our outpatient mental health center for children and adolescents who have anxiety and depression since the pandemic started and just some of the lasting effects from that. We hear various complaints um, from things like my son just has shut down. He used to be a great student. Now he doesn't care about school, doesn't care about his grades to, you know, my child's very stressed out on um, the social anxiety. They're scared to go back to school. Um, and it's a lot of various things that we as adults worry about too, when it comes to the pandemic, um, just about health and changes and all of those things that have gone on. So I think that languishing is kind of um, a middle ground between some of the more serious depression and anxiety that we see too. Prior to COVID, about 16% of our youth had some sort of mental health condition or disorder with depression and anxiety being the most common. A recent survey that I read or a poll said that now since the pandemic, approximately 46% of parents are seeing either new or worsening symptoms of anxiety and depression in their children and adolescents. So that's a huge increase in just a, sh a very short time. Some of the things that contribute to that are things that are happening in the home, you know, parents' loss of job, parental stress that certainly can affect children and adolescents too, fear of getting sick, fear of family members getting sick, of themselves being sick when they do return to school, the feelings of isolation that happened during quarantine that have now maybe continued. And we like to think that things are getting a little bit back to normal, but some of those fears and the uncertainty about the future are still there. I think there's also a lot of anger about how their lifestyle was forced to change during during the pandemic during the time of quarantine and still you know even after we're sort of getting back to some normalcy there's still a lot of lifestyle changes out there um, we are seeing a lot more um, anxiety and depression in girls than boys um, since this has started i think that's always been kind of the trend but right now the symptoms of sadness and worry are more prevalent in girls than boys certainly happening in boys too but more prevalent in girls some of the associated symptoms that Dr. Spurgeon also just kind of touched on, we see changes in sleep, negative sleep patterns, staying up late. I know this happened a lot during quarantine when the kids were on virtual learning. They think they can just stay up all night and then their sleep cycles are messed up. Um, they're tired during the day. So we know our teenagers do that anyway, but that definitely um, was more problematic during the pandemic and has continued on for some children. Also a lot of withdrawal, even though that seems kind of um, counter to they didn't like being in isolation during quarantine, but now we see a lot of withdrawal in the, our teenagers, even though that's normal to some extent that teenagers want some private time, they're, they're withdrawing from, from family and withdrawing from friends, and that can be problematic in and of itself too. And then in some of the more serious situations, we see aggression, verbal aggression and physical aggression that's happening. So really overall, I feel like teens right now are experiencing a mental health crisis as a result of the pandemic. You know, when we think about psychological development and brain development, um, teenagers and adolescents are at that time when they're biologically primed to seek independence. Their brains are ready to seek that independence from their families and to reach out, but COVID 
kind of squashed that and now that they had to stay at home. So their peer groups and social interactions are a really critical part of development during adolescence. So this has led to a lot of frustration and anxiety and depression. We know that teenagers are supposed to be stretching the boundaries, testing the limits, even though we as parents don't love that, that's part of normal development, getting out of the house, figuring out their place in their peer groups, in their community. They have to make mistakes to learn and grow from their mistakes. Um, and these are things that prepare them for adulthood and independence, but COVID has kept them at home and limited these opportunities. So in effect that has stunted their emotional growth and has led to many mental health concerns. Um, we know that peer relationships are a really big deal for teens. Um, their brains feel rewarded when they socialize. A lot of us are, but teens in particular. So spending time with friends helps them to discover their own identities and grow from that. Um, and so this has been very difficult for them. We know also that all of these social interactions, you know, months of virtual school, less time with friends, canceled sporting events and school activities, these have really affected our teens and also that emotional support that they seek from the people that they weren't able to see, maybe grandparents, um, teachers, coaches, religious leaders, even their mental health providers. You know, we weren't allowed to provide services for quite some time too. Um, so either outpatient or in the schools, a lot of those support systems were either eliminated or greatly reduced. So that's been very difficult for many of our children and adolescents. So there are lots of ways that we can help. Um, parents can play a really critical role in helping their teens cope with stress. And I think one of the most important things is just keeping the lines of communication open. Our teenagers don't like to talk to us a lot of times and that can be very difficult and frustrating, but um, having just open conversations, open asking open-ended questions, what we in the therapy world called active listening, you know, just listen to, truly listen to what they have to say and just asking them, how can I support you? How are you feeling? And listening to what they say. You don't have to have immediate answers. And a lot of times we don't have the answers, but just being present and having a sympathetic ear to, to try to truly understand what they're going through and giving them that time to talk when it's, when it feels comfortable and right for them. We also clearly know that teens have not fully developed their ability to regulate their emotions. Their emotions are all over the place a lot of times. So whether they want to admit it or not, they look to the important adults in their life to see how to cope and how they should react. So it's important for us as parents and adults to attempt to model calm and good coping skills. So what that in effect means is that we as adults have to have good self-care too, whether that be things like listening to calming music or exercise or reading or yoga. You know, I know that that self-care thing is a lot easier said than done in a busy working world, but it's important for us as adults and parents to have good mental health so that we can promote the mental health of our children too. And so that may also mean that parents need to seek mental health counseling for themselves so that they can be a good support system for their children. And then I think if those things aren't sufficient and you're still seeing a lot of concerns, a lot of symptoms of anxiety and depression in your children or teenagers, it's important to seek mental health help with a psychologist or a therapist or encouraging your child to talk to their school counselors. Um, there are a lot of people, they're religious leaders, you know, there are a lot of people that can be very supportive of your children. So sometimes advice coming from parents, um, children don't always take well. So giving them other systems of support can also be very important. There are also some apps. We know our kids love um, their electronics. So there are some apps that can be very helpful. There's one called Mindspace, and that has some relaxation techniques that children and adults can use. You just download that on your phone and it can be a helpful thing. So there's other sorts of technology like that that can be helpful too. Um, I think it's you know important to realize and try to know that teens do need privacy. They want privacy, but trying to figure out that that draw that line of where it's too much. If they're too withdrawn and not talking to family or friends or not interacting with people, then that, that can be a symptom of depression or a sign that maybe they do need some, some more intensive intervention and help. Um, like Dr. Spurgeon said too, the sleep patterns are very important. 
I know if I don't get enough sleep, you know, my mood is not the best. And so when these kids get in this negative pattern of staying up too late and their cycles are off, that can really have a negative impact on their mood. So helping them try to get some structure in their day and keeping those sleep wake patterns at least somewhat regulated can really help with their mood. Um, so overall, I think just in general, modeling good coping skills, encouraging healthy habits, really trying to listen to them and understand what they're going through are some of the most important things we can do to support our kids. And if that's not sufficient, then, then seeking out mental health um, help from the professionals can really, really be important for them so that they don't continue down a path to where the, the problems be become worse and more problematic for them. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Meredith and she can speak some more on what she's seeing going on in the schools. Great. Thanks, Jill. Um, I love what you guys both said and you'll just take what you guys said and then put it down to the next level for younger children and young adolescents um, seeing the same kinds of things. I love what Dr. Spurgeon said about the languishing um, and we see that in children as well. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we're addressing mental health concerns um, because especially in school, it's critical um, for kids because there are so many that have an emotional or behavioral or mental health disorder that's severe enough that it impacts their daily functioning while they're here at school. And so um, my job and, and our job here um, at the school is to just ensure that they are in a safe place. Um, our, our goal is always to make sure that they feel safe and they feel cared for um, and loved while they're here at school. And uh, ultimately the goal is, is academics here. Um, we are in a school, so ultimately that's our goal here is academic performance. But um, what we see is that these, um, these either trauma or um, some environmental stressors are what's affecting kids the most here while they're um, at school. Um, and so we talk about um, people addressing their feelings and adults and sometimes teenagers, but um, children don't um, sometimes even know their feelings or understand what they're feeling. And we might ask them what they're feeling and they're very puzzled by that because they don't even know um, what those feelings are. So um, introducing them to all feelings is really important here. I work a lot with that. In fact, I have them hanging on my wall, all the different feelings um, that they may experience um, even in just a day. So um, I think it's critical that we work with them on that. Um, I work with children a lot on um, coping skills and their social skills, managing those feelings, um, setting goals uh, to get them through the day or week or long-term goals, whatever it might be. Um, our younger children work better with short-term goals and rewarding those um, short-term goals here at school. Um, and I also work with children a lot that have anxiety and depression. Um, as the school social worker, I do a brief counseling with kids. So um, just few uh, solution focused uh, meetings with students on that. And um, if it's about anxiety, it might be focusing on um, their circle of control, you know, what they can control, what they can't control, um, identifying those things. Um, once we go uh, uh, past a certain amount of, I, I guess, sessions, um, then I do refer them on to, to mental health providers just because of the different roles um, that I play here at school as a school social worker, uh, because I, I do a lot of teaching here and that's a proactive measure, um, focusing on, on student needs. Uh, and those have changed throughout the years. Um, you know, those, it used to be character traits on kindness and respect and it, and it still is, but now uh, I did one whole, um, lesson a whole month on COVID. And the first lesson of, of the year was on feelings, identifying feelings, coping with feelings. And so I had not done that before. Um, so those have changed. We try to address um, what's going on now and we focus on um, what's crucial right now. And, and COVID definitely had an impact on our school year. Uh, I, you know, in our community, we had a uh, remote or, or hybrid, but most of the time we were in session here in the elementary. Um, and, and dealing with the COVID was different for each child, of course, and their experiences, maybe in their environment, uh, based on 
uh, their family's experience with it, um, how they felt about it, their anxiety about COVID. And um, of course, if families lost uh, jobs or even lost loved ones, um, that had an impact on the kids here. And then uh, what was difficult for some of our kids was then separating from those caregivers that they had been with for quite some time. Uh, we ended school here in, in March in person and you know went through until August and they were with those, those young ones were with their caregivers uh, for a really long time at home. Um, I know myself, my own, we were together a long time. And so a lot of kids had a lot of difficulty separating from those people. So um, we definitely saw an impact here and a rise in some anxiety and, and depression here as well. Um, I get a lot of questions about advice for, for parents. I, I work a lot with parents. I'm kind of that mediator between um, parents and children and teacher and nurse. And so I get a lot of questions for advice for kids. And it, it really um, replicates what, what you two have already said, um, Dr. Christopher and Dr. Spurgeon, about um, being transparent and honest with kids too is really crucial. Um, not, not so honest, uh, that it scares them, but, um, honest about, you know, feelings and, and things like that. And one of the most important things that I can tell people is to build relationships. Uh, we see kids here that, um, sometimes we say that kids are, are seeking our attention. Um, and really they're seeking a connection. We, we see that with, through their behavior and their actions that they really are just looking for connections and not through social media. Uh, that's become a huge factor um, more and more. It gets younger and younger every year that I see that um, have that impact on our kids. Um, and that we do the sleep, the diet, the schedule, all of those things that you guys mentioned before are just as important with our young kids. Um, kids respect a schedule uh, that they say they don't, but they, they do and they need one. And um, I'm one of those, I was on Pinterest two weeks after that after the quarantine saying, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? We've got to have some sort of schedule here. And um, not only when we're not in school, but when we're in school as well, that we have seen that that produces um, great results for our kids as well. So, um, and I also say, utilize your resources. Um, they're out there. They, they are out there. Utilize them, whether that be school resources or in our community, um, your family physicians, uh, behavioral plans at school. I mean, there's, there's just so many to reach out to us and, and we're always here, here to help. So I think that's it. Thank you all so much. Lots of good uh, information and advice for sure. Um, we are now at that point um, that we will invite the audience to submit questions to our panelists using the Q&A function on your screen. If the icons are not visible on your screen, you may need to hover over the upper or lower part of the screen to have them appear. So we ask that you please use the Q&A function and not the chat icon to submit your questions. If you'd like, again, your questions to be anonymous, you may check that box. Also, if you'd like to ask a question directly to one of our panelists, then you know, please type their name in that field and I will direct that to them. Otherwise, I will probably be just pushing out those questions. Uh, some will certainly be, um, if they're children related, would certainly go to either Meredith or Dr. Christopher and, and maybe some adult things then, of course, to Dr. Spurgeon. But, um, all of those questions that come uh, in will be in queue and I will read those um, as they're submitted. So I see a few have come up in queue. So let's begin. All right. I have to click on. How has COVID-19 heightened the problems associated with mental health in our community? Is that elevation, if that's the case, still evident? How long might you think this will continue? Thanks, Dan Davis with the Community Foundation of Jackson County. 
Dr. Spurgeon, would you like to? So I'll start. I, I think that, you know, it's interesting. After like a natural disaster, um, uh, probably the closest thing we know is, uh, at least in our this time period, it would be like September 11th. If you think about what happened at September 11th, you know, the few months after September 11th, there's a huge rallying cry. You know, it's almost like people were good for a while, even though this horrible thing had happened, but there was a community togetherness that is a very common response to disaster. Um, and then the farther we got out, you just watched people begin sort of falling apart. Um, and so, because what happens is that community response begins to break down. You know, things start going back to normal, except after something that has happened, everybody's changed by it. So it's, I hate the word new normal because that was my least favorite word in all of pandemic, but we are, we're not going to get through this, the same people we were when we started. And so everybody reacclimating and finding their place means there's things that are shifted around. Because if you think about it, when your body has had a trauma, and most people would say the pandemic has had some trauma associated with it just from being separate, then everybody figures out how to put that trauma into a place within their own system. So if you've had lots of past traumas, you might see that your anxiety and depression or symptoms increase. Um, you know, if this is your first sort of trauma or first real sort of make you question life thing, you might be able to say, oh, well, this is this, I put it here and it sort of sits in a box and it, it changes you, but not maybe as much as somebody else. So in that process, it's like everybody's trying to find their new place. And that sounds a little like hokey <laughs> when I hear myself say it, but I, I do think that the process of this has really made people um, stop and think. And then we add all the political divisiveness and uh, there's all kinds of other things that happened on top of the pandemic that people are having to figure out where, what they think and feel about it. That I just think it's a time that um, we are seeing to me, way more now than I did right when it started. So that first month after we were sort of quarantined, it was sort of like, okay, we have time to sort of flip over to telemedicine. And there were people who were struggling, but nothing like right now. My acuity is higher. My number of re referrals are out the roof. I, I mean, people are struggling with what the long-term consequences of this. Do we know what it's going to be long, like long, long term? No. Um, you know, are there things people are trying to predict? Yes, there's always people who try to predict. I think we're going to learn a whole lot of interesting information five years from now that we don't know now based on what has happened. Thank you. Um, in an emergency situation, um, what do we need to do? Do we know, need to go to the ER? Is there a hotline number we can call? What's the protocol? I'll answer that or I'll start with that. Um, I do think if it's a true emergency, absolutely go to the emergency room. And I think a true emergency would be, from a mental health perspective, would be defined as someone being a danger to themselves or others. So having suicidal thoughts, having thoughts of harming someone else, um, and so they would need immediate intervention. And so that would be through going directly to the emergency room. There are some national suicide hotlines um, that can be helpful, but I think if it's a true emergency, absolutely go to the emergency room. There's a crisis team there. They can help with placement at psychiatric hospitals if the person needs that. Um, if it's more just sort of my depression symptoms are worsening or I'm, I'm feeling a lot more anxious, then and it's not an acute true emergency, just the person may be feeling overwhelmed, then I would suggest contacting your, your mental health provider or your primary care provider um, the next, you know, during the day or whenever the next business hours would be to do that. Because it, it's also problematic when people go to the emergency room for non-emergency situations. So I think that's kind of, Dr. Spurgeon, I don't know if you want to add to that, but 
that would be my definition of when you need to go to the emergency room. If it's truly a matter of life or death or someone's having serious thoughts of wanting to harm themselves or someone else. Well, and I think that we have to be really honest. You know, a lot of people want to come to our office. I mean, we have people walk in saying, you know, my I'm feeling suicidal and we're not a walk in clinic and people are like, well, why not? Well, the reality is because the need is so high that we would never be able to serve people's needs. So that is why most mental health facilities you you have to have an appointment for the emergency room is for, you know, gosh, I can't keep myself safe. I'm going to do something. But we at this point, the I would say the number of people trying to get referrals and to get seen I, I think Jill and I've spoken about this before is just really high and we are doing our best to see people as quickly as possible and get them sort of hooked into care. I think the flip side of that is we also have to realize once you're in care, you want to be taken care of. And so that's always the rate limiting factor. Can I do 50 new intakes a day? Well, 50 might be too many, but 20. I could see 20 new people a day, um, but that's not going to do you any good if I can't see you back and make sure what we decide to do for you works. So you have to have a little bit of patience, which I know is not anybody's strong suit when you're not feeling good. But I think the flip side of that is knowing that once you get in, we're really trying to take care of what you need. Um, and so I think that it is a hard balance right now because the need far outweighs what we, what services and what opportunities. So we have to be a little bit um, more creative than normal. Um, I think that um, religious um, leaders are a good place to get a little bit of extra help. Um, and I know several pastors in town have really stepped up to try to help until we can get people in where they need to be. People need to have a primary care provider. I can't tell you how important a primary care provider is. It's important for your overall health, but it's also important because if you see your doctor when you are sick, they get to know you. And so when you're not well, they know you better than most other people and can sort of go, wow, this is sort of not normal for them and at least begin to help you navigate um, care. I work with all the primary care doctors pretty much in Seymour. I mean, they can pretty much call me. So if they don't know how to start you in your mental health care, they will call me and say, hey, this is just something I haven't seen before. I will talk to them. We will get you started until we can get you in and be seen. It's not a perfect system, um, but I think I speak for everybody on this panel. We are doing the best we can to provide as much care as we can. Thank you so much. My the next question. My spouse is a first responder. I am concerned he's addicted to pain medication. How do I approach the topic with him or do I? And are there resources or programs for first responders in these situations or where do we turn for help? I think that's a hard question to answer in some ways, just because it, so much of this is a case by case. So can I tell you how to handle how to handle it with your spouse? I can't tell you that. Can I say, telling your spouse you're concerned, you are the person who knows them best. Um, if you can find a way to tell them you're concerned without sounding accusatory, I think you're probably the person they're most likely to hear it from. Um, substance abuse care is difficult because if they do not think they have a problem, then it gets much more harder to get more difficult to get treatment. Um, cause so much of treatment is the person who has the problem understanding they have a problem and wanting to do something different. Is there substance abuse treatment? Yes. Um, I think at Centerstone at Christopher and Associates at Mental Health, Schneck Mental Health and Wellness. I think we all treat, I mean, the co occurrence in mental health issues and substance abuse is very high. There's also um, Suboxone Clinic in Seymour, um, I think, I think it's still there, which is a medication assisted therapy for opiate use. So, I mean, there are definitely resources available. 
Um, again, a good place to start if you're willing to get started in treatment is with your primary care doctor because they will know and put you on the right path. Excellent, thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, suggestions on what I can do to help my students adjust to all the changes that have occurred with COVID. Some of them are happy to be back in school while others don't want to be there. What can I do to help the, get these students back on track? Meredith, would you like to try to tackle that one? Sure. Um, we have dealt with this as well this year at school, um, that it's been hard for an adjustment that some kids um, were dying to come back to school. They couldn't wait um, to be back here. And there were others that enjoyed um, being at home um, for the remote learning. So um, the change um, has been difficult, um, but I would um, I, I would advise them if they are a teacher to talk to them about change. Um, Change is, is something that um, is difficult for a lot of people, most people, no matter what that change is. Um, so I focus a lot with, with working with kids on um, the benefits of change. Um, what does it look like? What, you know, what do the changes look like? Do they have anxiety about the change um, or are they angry about it? So maybe trying to focus on what that feeling is and if it's you know, a specific, a specific um, student need, um, that is something that you know, counselors work with, school counselors work with, um, with children um, on that as well as figuring out what is the cause of that distress and why they don't um, if they don't want to be there, what that's about. So um, I also work with families on that as well, with the parents on that too. So focusing on if there's some environmental factors there too in the home. Dr. Christopher, do you have anything else to weigh in on that? I was just also thinking maybe what what was their perception of how it was going to be to return to school versus what the reality of that was. And I think Meredith, you probably see this some too, but certainly more for teenagers with social media, you know, that has, I mean, we could go on for hours about social media and the positives and negatives about that. But I think a lot of the anxiety that we're seeing in some of these kids are just, they don't know how things have changed since they were at home and since they were quarantined. And then once they do go back to school, maybe what they're seeing on Snapchat or seeing on all their social media, we know that that's not always accurate. People portray themselves on social media differently than what's truly happening. And so then what their perception of how their relationships, how their relationships were before they were at home on virtual learning and then how they go back, there's a lot of anxiety there and how those are gonna play out. So maybe they thought they were gonna come back and still be best friends with the person that they were best friends with when school ended, but then that person is you know, doing something different. So those perceptions of how they thought things were gonna be and then how they've played out may be very different, which then is causing some of the anxiety. So uh, that could be something to talk with them about too. And I think too, over the summer, it's gonna be important for them to keep their social connections and not withdraw back into, you know, just being at home playing video games all day or, you know, keeping those social connections up because it is very important. Yeah, I had that question today, as a matter of fact, about, um, how do I keep kids um, from being on social media all summer? You know, they're about to be home for the summer and what can I do? That's all they want to do. Um, and so I recommend it to them now, and these are younger children, of course, you know, um, kindergarten through fifth grade. And um, I, I did suggest once again, a schedule for them on the amount of time that they spend on that. And um, they don't like it um, when you take them off of it, but uh, it is amazing what they come up with to do um, when they're not on it. Um, they'll be angry at first and then um, they're bored and they figure out something to do. So um, we do, we have talked about that a lot recently with a lot of parents is what am I going to do um, with that? So good point. I will say as somebody who's treating the adults too, I think it's important for teachers and people in the school to also understand while you think the parents know what's going on, even well-intentioned parents who are trying to keep up with their kids, whether they're working from home or working a job they're not familiar with because they had to change jobs because the pandemic, there's a lot of distractions in parents' lives. 
and they don't always get their kid is struggling. Um, and one of the best gifts that you can give them if you notice a kid not doing well is to say, hey, I notice your child struggling. I talked to him or her, but I wanted to let you know, hey, if there anything I can do to help? And, and some of that is just, you know, with, again, with all of the stuff we have in the schools, you can look online and see their grades and all of those things. But sometimes stuff is lost in translation between what you think the parents know and what they actually know. Cause kids are really good at saying, oh, I did that or, you know, whatever. And as a parent, you want to believe your kid. Um, and so sometimes I think some crisis can be avoided also just with a clear line of communication. And particularly in the midst of this world of everything, there's just so much information right now. Sometimes a simple phone call can be a, something that is a game changer for kids and for their parents who, again, I'm treating the adults who are like, I'm trying and I can't keep up with all this. And I'm like, have you talked to his teacher? Well, I don't want to bother them. Well, maybe you should just check in, say, I don't want to bother you, but I just want to check in and see how my child was doing. Because again, there's just a lot of things that this year is just made different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and having the parent inform the teacher or the therapist or whomever about things that they're seeing at home too. You know, we know that kids deal with emotions through behavior a lot of times. So having an understanding of why we're seeing those behaviors can be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Spurgeon, this may be more directed to you. My mom is elderly and is in the nursing home. She struggled socially through this last year due to COVID. As things start opening up, how do we as her family retrain her to be social again without causing anxiety? So the reality is you probably can't. Anxiety, so the concept of anxiety is when you avoid something you're anxious about, anxiety grows. And so for people who have been, who have just sort of baseline anxiety, who have by necessity been sort of away from people, we basically have to do sort of a stepwise reintroduction to, hey, this is what it feels like to go out and have dinner. And you can do that a lot of different ways where it feels very safe. Like you just go someplace where it's just you guys, your family as your first step. And then you sort of add a little more, maybe you go to a restaurant the next time, but you slowly begin adding back. Um, and maybe some of it is you just go visit her at the nursing home first where she's in her territory. So there's a fancy word for that. It's called systematic desensitization. And it basically is just keep stepping forward. It, it's, it's going to cause some anxiety with each step forward but it, in the long run, it'll make it where you can get back to the baseline, your baseline of functioning. Anytime we let anxiety tell us we can't do something, and if we give in to that, then the anxiety grows. So that is sort of the whole premise behind why we use systematic desensitization in treatment of anxiety disorders. Thank you. Um, a question here. Thank you. I comment first. Thank you for what you do. I work full time for a local sheriff's department in addition to being with Awareness Washington County. We are often involved with people who are suffering from mental health problems, mostly due to current or previous drug usage. We need more emergency resources to help these folks. Do you know of anything being done in the future for more emergency resources to be available 24 seven when we need to assist these people? Is anyone aware of anything? I mean, pretty much all we have 24 seven is the local emergency room. Yeah. I mean, the re there's rehab facilities all over the state of Indiana that if they're deemed and willing to go to rehab, they can go from the emergency room. Um, it, but I don't know of any new, I don't know of anything new coming up. Do you guys know? I don't, unfortunately. Great. I do think one, I mean, this isn't really necessarily emergency, but one thing that a positive that has come out of the pandemic is 
more um, acceptance and use of telemedicine. And mm -hmm. so even if there are not providers locally who have openings, um, and I know this is not just a local issue with, you know, having tons of referrals and just a lack of um, time to get people in for the services that they need. But if there are other providers throughout the state, then they can access those services through telehealth and telemedicine. Um, so that does open up, you know, some possibilities for service. You know, I could see a therapist who's located up out, you know, um, up in Northern Indiana, that's something that I couldn't easily drive to. So there are some more possibilities that way with opening up for services. That's not necessarily really for emergency kind of services, but it does give more options for treatment providers. Well, just a comment, this made me think about um, my insurance company had sent um, a little note actually talking about uh, telehealth mental health providers through your insurance company and it provided like a hotline number that you could call so that might be a possibility for others um, who have insurance to be able to uh, access you might even call your own uh, insurance company to see what they have I, I know the state of Indiana the health department had a COVID mental health line where you could access providers I don't know if that's still up and running or not but uh, for various reasons. And I think they were quite busy. And actually the insurance companies, I, I think were mandated to cover telehealth and telemedicine at the same level as they would in-person services due to the state of emergency. And some insurance companies, there was an end date to that and some um, it was kind of indefinite. And so that would be something to check with your own personal insurance company about. But I believe that it's still that most insurances are covering the, the telehealth and tele no, no. <laughs> most, uh, I'm, I'm, we're about half and half, about half are saying no at this point. I would say if we wanted to look at how we can advocate for mental health care, telehealth absolutely is one of the places we should be lobbying and talking to our state representatives about continuing it as a service. I understand some people wanna come in the office and I am completely fine with that. But for people who are working, it allows them to go in their car and be seen and not have to tell their boss or take off work. Um, so it increases access to care. And I can tell you when I was working from home doing telehealth, I was probably seeing five more people per day than I could see in person, only because if somebody doesn't show, you can slide somebody else into that position. And so when people are willing to be on a cancellation list, you can get them in and get them be seen um, just because you don't have to wait for them to drive to the office. So there are definite pros and cons to telehealth, but I think particularly for access to care for mental health care, we should be fighting to keep telehealth as a benefit for those who want to use it. That's covered the same as if the people who want to come into the office. Absolutely. Great advice. I do have a comment that just came through on the Q&A. Um, it said there is a website for mental health resources, which is www.bewellindiana.com. So people might try that to um, access some resources as well. It looks like we are down to about seven minutes left in our webinar this evening. And I would like to pose one last question to each of our panelists. Um, I will start with you, Meredith. The same question will go to each of our panelists. So if there is one thing you would like the attendees to take away from this session, from your perspective, what would that be? Um, I think I said this earlier when I, I said I get a lot of questions from, from parents about um, how to help their children. And um, one of the things uh, that I see the most is um, about building relationships with kids and spending, spending quality time with them and um, building trust and making them feel, feel safe um, is crucial for them. Um, we have kids that experience um, a lot of a lot of trauma in their life and um, some environmental stressors that make it very difficult for them and um, we notice that when we build relationships with them and whether it be that you are their caregiver um, or their mental health provider or their school counselor um, or their pastor like you guys have said um, 
it is, it's crucial for them to, to have that relationship um, so that they feel safe because when they feel safe and they feel loved, um, uh, the possibilities are endless for them. They feel like they can accomplish things and they feel like they can get through the day. Um, and, and when they don't, when they feel insecure, um, those insecurities um, creep in for them and, and some, some isolation for them. And then we see a lot of behaviors and a lot of acting out and a lot of anger um, built up. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the fight or flight response um, when, when they're faced with, with a tough situation. So um, I'm just always encouraging more and more to get off, off the devices and um, spend time together no matter what it is, no matter what you're doing with them. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. Yeah, um, I completely agree with everything that Meredith said. I think relationships are key, trying to build those relationships with your children and just letting them know that you're there, even if they don't want to talk about it at the time, letting them know that you're available and that you will listen when they are ready. Um, and understanding, and this is, you know, it's hard in the heat of the moment when, your teenagers love you one second and they're slamming a door the next second, but really trying to maintain your own calm and not escalate those situations because they will absolutely escalate when you escalate. So trying to model better coping skills and calmness and just basically like Meredith said, letting them know that you're there and that you're willing to listen and help them in any way that you can. And if you can't help them, then you're willing to figure out ways um, and seek out other professionals who can. Dr. Spurgeon. I guess I would say um, that mental health treatment is a difficult thing in the United States. The stigma attached to it is hard. The availability of good treatment is limited. So access to care is difficult and you can get very overwhelmed in the midst of trying to get help when you're not feeling your best anyway. And I would just say, don't give up. You know, you will find some place. Sometimes you have to look real hard for it. Sometimes you have to ask somebody to help you. Um, and there are people who will help you. Even if we don't take your insurance at Steck Mental Health and Wellness, we try to give you some other options or at least talk you through how to find who, who is in your insurance. Um, you know, this we're a community that really does try to take care of our own community, even though I know sometimes people don't feel that on a daily basis um, because we're also an imperfect community as well. Um, but I think that the quest for good care and for, you know, when, when the oxygen mask drops, they say, put it on yourself first before you help somebody else. You have to help yourself so that you can be available to help the people around you. Um, I think it's just an important thing to understand that if you keep trying, it will, it will work out eventually. Don't give up. Thank you so much, ladies. I'd like to take this opportunity to once again, thank our panelists for their time and willingness to share their knowledge. We value the insights and the guidance that you've provided tonight. I'd also like to recognize the foundation staff for coordinating and hosting this webinar. Thank you to our attendees who participated tonight. We hope you found the information valuable. From Schneck Foundation, Thank you for joining tonight's virtual presentation as we advance our mission of caring together. Good night. <laughs>